Your name is Ramzi Rizk. You were uh, born in uh, Lebanon, and now you are in Berlin. And tell us the rest. Uh, um, yeah, that's that's pretty. I don't have like a funny, interesting sort of immigrant story, to be honest. So there's there's no like <laughs> positive vibes here. Um, I was born in Lebanon. I was raised there. Um, really liked Germany and uh, had been here a few times as a kid. So when I finished my bachelor's in computer science, I decided, or right before that, I decided I'm coming to Germany. Um, for, for a variety of reasons, I, I picked Hamburg. The main reason was that I went there on the two days um, of 2012, I think it was, where it was really sunny. And I thought that that's how Hamburg was like. Didn't oh, do well. my research. There was a lot uh, of data points there. Right yeah, now. no, I know, but um, this was 2012. The internet wasn't really... <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I went did my master's in Hamburg, but um, never really felt the city. Uh, f one of the other reasons being that I lived in Harburg. So if you know Hamburg, you know that Harburg is not really Hamburg. So. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. All right. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah so um, I did not really feel at home there. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> And uh, and this was actually a very interesting time. I think in in uh, in, in in Hamburg and Harburg, I was at the TU Harburg, which was like famous for um, a bunch of really interesting people that came from a similar part of the world <laughs> as myself. <laughs> I'm I'm I'm, I'm sugarcoating it, but basically, but basically, when I uh, when I first walked into the university um, office, uh, talking about like res you know accommodations and if they can do something there. Um, the woman there was like, uh, yeah, you know, it's really hard. You're kind of, it's late September, so most places are gone. We do have uh, Mohammed Atta's apartment available. <laughs> and, and I was like, I love this country. Like, you know, that's the <laughs> bright kind of humor, the, the darkness. And so, um, um, yeah, I, 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 I fell in love with Berlin. I was in Berlin all the time. At some point, I was here four days a week. So I just moved here, finished my master's from here. You, you basically swapped uh, Sky Bar for Panorama Bar. Yeah, you could you could say that. I I, uh, I didn't really go out much in Hamburg like when I was there. Would, but uh, yeah, Panaba back in the day that was uh, that was an experience. So moved to Berlin, started uh, finished my masters, started doing a PhD for a few years. Um, really hated academics. Uh, did not really get along well with that whole you know it was like Wirtschaftsinformatik, which is sort of information systems. So a bit of economics and a bit of call it technology, but it's really just power suits and, and power ties and PowerPoint. Um, and I, I realized that that was not for me, so I, I switched and started researching privacy in, in social media. It was around 2007, 2008, I think. Um, and at the same time, got was giving one of these classes, so I gave a bunch of classes at, at, at the HU, um, where I recommend you don't really hire people that graduated around that time because uh, I was really <laughs> bad really bad I won't say the years but I was really bad at it um, and and I joined this little startup for for around 10 months as their CTO they were doing the social network right before Facebook went global um, they were doing really well for the first six months um, trying to build really cool stuff and sort of connect students in Turkey for some reason with with one another and offering them all of these services and then uh, Facebook went global and within I think the first three weeks they had 10 million active users in Turkey and uh, and I just basically realized that it was over was um, recruited into this other company building up stuff not going to let a lot and anyway 2010 late 2010 I met uh, a bunch of guys um, or I, I, I invited a bunch of guys over uh, friends of mine and we started talking about um, about photography which was sort of the connecting line between the four of us um, yeah, and, and I think the end of that night we realized that we were quitting our jobs, starting a company, and um, 2011, beginning of 2011 was when we founded I Am. It's been going six and a half years, roughly, strong. Should I intro I Am as well, or should I stop talking? Yeah, no, no, go on. Okay. I will interrupt. All right, cool, yeah, so, um, and I officially actually only dropped out of my PhD um, when we founded the company, my professor was still writing me, going like, "So your thesis is six months late. Um, are you <laughs> handing it over? It's eight months late now. Um, he doesn't do that anymore." Uh, yeah, so we we started I am I am is um, is a photography company, and at the end of the day, it's uh, it's a global community of now 22 million photographers that we um, that we support. 
we uh, um, help get discovered, get published, get exhibited, uh, get the exposure that they deserve, learn, become better through a variety of things, and also that we connect with, with global brands and, and um, iconic agencies and so on and help them monetize their imagery. And we do that through a lot of computer vision technology that I think we'll be talking about at some point probably, um, that, that we've also developed in-house. So. Before, before we go on, I want to ask you, because you are one of so many uh, aspiring PhDs or then PhDs in computer science who move into uh, a startup because it's more interesting, or a tech company because it's more interesting. Is it the case that today the actually interesting science in computer science is being done in some companies like, you know, the obvious ones being Google, Facebook, but also a lot of smaller companies that do my impression is the most yeah. advanced type of uh, tech research. It, it, it kind of depends on how you look at it. I mean, uh, you know, AI is the, the, the buzzword uh, du jour. And the reality is everything that has all of this innovation that we talk about today in, in, in AI is stuff that researchers were working on in the 60s and the 70s. So in, in that sense, it's not innovation. Uh, sure, they have more cash. And, uh, and they have more of a hacker mentality. I think it's more of, a, of an attitude than, than anything else. I think um, there's a lot of ridiculously amazing research going on in, in a lot of places in the world. If you look at Max Planck, what these guys are doing across the various branches, if you look at, at Fraunhofer, if you look at uh, all the universities around, they're doing really amazing work. But um, one, it doesn't see the light of day. Two, it takes a lot of time. And, and eventually, it makes it as a product out there. But I, I think it's the lack, funnily enough, not the lack of technical skills, but the lack of business acumen that gives companies like Google and, and Apple and Facebook and so on the edge because they have these same people. They basically hire them away. They poach them. Again, the attractive thing now is to hire um, you know, machine learning AI professors, Jeff Hinton at Google, Jan Lequin at, at, at Facebook and so on. Um, a few years back, it was more, you know, more whatever, people with, with GPS knowledge or, or God knows what. But um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say exclusively that uh, innovation and exciting work is the, is the sole domain of, um, of corporations, no. Okay. So when, when we say that uh, IM is an AI-powered company, what does that really mean? What does the AI do exactly with the pictures that get taken yeah, and put um, onto the platform? Cool. So maybe I probably need to sort of explain a little bit about the workflow around around IM and and the problem we're trying to solve right so the when we got together six and a half years ago uh, and founded the company we realized that the problem was not going to be content creation there were enough people with enough phones with enough cameras taking enough photos it's not about content creation the problem is really a, a one of of discovery there's enough noise there's no signal how do we make sense of that visual noise? How do we sort of find the content before it disappears into visual nirvana? If, if you think about, um, I think a trillion photos, uh, a little more than a trillion photos, maybe even two trillion photos were, were shared online last year. That is more photos than were created in the entire history of mankind before that. This year it's probably gonna be again, uh, uh, it's that exponential explosion of content creation that um, the challenge is not to create content anymore. So we realized that in order to, to be able to make sense of that, I those images, to make sense of them, whether it is to make them searchable for, for, um, for sales purposes, to allow people to find the stuff they want to buy, whether it is to, to be able to tell stories, whether it is to be able to automate a lot of these processes, we needed to build technology. And we needed to build technology that, um, that can really do two things. One is understand what is in a photo. Basically look at a photo and say, there's an audience, it's indoors, there's you know, rustic lights, uh, fancy couches, there's people holding microphones. Basically describe the scene in as near a perfect way as possible. And the second one, probably the more interesting one, is actually decide on the quality of the photo. And that's where sort of the, the you know, human versus AI question comes up quite a bit. Um, is this a beautiful photo or not? Is this a commercially viable photo or not? Will this photo go viral on Twitter? with the target demographic. So um, we set out, again, a few years ago to answer these two questions in order to be able to open up um, the possibility for our 22 million photographers to earn money with their images initially, but with the, with the stated purpose down the road of indexing all the world's visual media. And so how does the algorithm decide if it's a good photo or not? Is it based on some 
basic aesthetic criteria or on a statistical analysis of what has worked before and what hasn't? So how many here are actually familiar with, with AI and as it's being sort of bandied about? OK, cool. So, so Evo, yeah, sure. Uh, so very, it's very. It's going to kill us. Huh? It's going to kill us. <laughs> no, we're going to kill ourselves before it kills us. So, no, um, so the basic thing about, about at least this, this sort of branch of AI that we talk about these days, um, deep learning in particular, is you give it a set of data and you tell it what you expect out of it. You give it a thousand photos of dogs, a thousand photos of cats, a thousand photos of donkeys, and you tell them, these are cats, these are dogs, these are donkeys. You throw them into mach the machine. The machine tries to, I mean, it's, it's a very simpli simplistic uh, um, explanation, but the machine tries to mimic uh, you know, sort of a very limited version of how our neurons work um, by having these different layers, and each layer triggers on certain things that it discovers. At the end, it recognizes that there are certain features in these photos that will help me identify them as a dog, certain features that will help me identify this as a cat and as a donkey. Um, so this is basically how a very, very simple model would work. And then you, if it hits a certain level of accuracy, you evaluate it against images that it had never seen before. Um, that's pretty much the same thing for, for aesthetics. I mean, it, it does get a little more complicated because of how we're sampling and how we're selecting content and so on. Our advantage, I think, um, apart from the fact that you know we have really, really smart people working on this that probably could explain this much better than I could, our advantage is that we have 22 million photographers that for the past six and a half years have been telling us what content they like and what content they dislike. We have uh, image curators that work at IM that have been picking images to feature. Um, we have buyers that have been licensing content. So we have all of these data points. And the fundamental thing about this whole AI revolution is there's more data, and it's not just any data. It has to be structured data. So we have that. We've built all of these algorithms around it that, um, that can detect this stuff. And that's, that's really as simple as I could explain it. Um, I was reading, you know, when, when I was pre preparing for this conversation, I was, I was reading uh, a bit around, and it's not very difficult when researching you guys that articles in the Guardian pop up, articles in the New York Times, and like, in short, you're sort of hot shit, right? And I was just wondering what, does that, what that does to the founding team in terms of, uh, you know, that, in a way, notoriety, and uh, do you, I mean, do you, do you feel that? Uh, and is it, is it something which influences basically how, you know, is it something you can leverage, but does it also have, I don't know, some distracting factors? Uh, yeah, it's not like I walked on the street and people recognized me. I mean, it happens. Uh, it happens maybe if I'm walking between like Alta Schoenhauser and Weinmeister, and, and you know, there's it's like lunch break for most of the startups. But I think, I think, I think humility is something that also connected the four of us, the four founders from day one, and it's, uh, I think you can draw that line with throughout our entire company. We're, we're, we're real people. We're not, uh, we, we know our limitations, and, and we know where we are, and we travel a lot. And traveling is, I think, the best cure for a big ego, because, uh, you know, we might be big in Berlin, or big in Kreuzberg, or big, you know, on in Kreuzberg <laughs> between Kotti and, and Schönleinstraße, or, or, you know, but go go to uh, you know go to Silicon Valley and you realize that there's a million IMs over there mm. and that you have to fucking fight every single minute of the day to stay relevant and uh, and uh, that that keeps you humble. Besides, you're you know it's never as bad or it's never as good as everyone looking in from the outside thinks it is. It's never as bad as you personally think it is, but it's uh, yeah. So no no no. Talking of Silicon no, Valley and, and Berlin and the difference, shouldn't you guys be there? Um, you know, in terms of, are you are you really able to get the same quality of people in terms of the engineering, for instance, the machine learning? Like, are you able to attract them to Berlin? Do, do they really want to come? Or are they already here? Which I doubt. Um, yeah. I I I you know th there's there's always like it's one of like the three four questions that always come up when when. Damn. Comparison when the I comparison thought, happens. I, I thought I was being no, no. It's 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 all right. Um, 
we don't have trouble hiring the absolute best engineers out there. Um, we don't have trouble hiring machine vision researchers. We have more people than we can hire in our pipelines. It's as simple as that. Um, I don't think the people, the kind of people we want to hire as well, which, which plays a big role, the kind of people we want to hire um, are also the kind of people that would want to live here. And that plays a big, a big role. We're not hiring the the tech bros that want the perks and and uh, and want the you know the neck massages and God knows what of of uh, you know living in you know middle of the desert in Silicon Valley. I'm not. I'm, I don't want to diss anyone. It's just it's there's no problem. I think I think it's the whole the whole Berlin versus whatever is just it's it's passé. It's old. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's played at least on the tech side. Engineers that I've hired, I've I've basically hired away engineers from prominent Silicon Valley companies for half the pay. They come here, they live better, they save money, and they have a better quality of life, and, and they can build really cool shit. I don't think you will ever struggle to hire good people if you have the right culture and if you're building interesting stuff. And it won't be the ping pong table that, that gets them over, and it won't be any of that stuff. If, if they know that they're working on good things, on interesting things, on things that will help and impact, you'll get anyone you want. That's not a problem. Okay, we, we spoke at length about how amazing you guys are. Now uh, let's Thank you. let's speak about the real stuff. Uh, what was the most difficult parts in building? Um, I am like, w which which were the moments where you guys felt we, you're gonna, uh, yeah. You mean today or in general? Well, over the past years. Uh, it's, uh you know, <sighs> do, did did you have a few moments where you thought you're at the breaking point? Again, today or in general. It's uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a what, roller coaster. What? You have that you have that thing every single day. There's 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 moments pretty much every day where you, where you're like, holy fuck, what what the hell is wrong with me? Why am I doing this? And uh, and then and then Wh why do they arise these moments? Um, I mean, it's it's existential angst, right? I mean, being a startup founder is sort of the equivalent of being a 15 year old teenager in high school trying to figure out whether the girl sitting next to you in the in the in, in class actually likes you or not and it's does she it's i never know i i'm single i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 terrifying uh, you know you 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 have responsibilities up and down the ladder you you have responsibilities to 75 people that that make up your team that that you care for that you would never want to hurt but that you also know you need to push because they're the ones that are producing the value um you you have responsibilities towards your community because you've built something that is of value and you don't want to let them down responsibilities to your investors towards the marketplace towards the buyers that are licensing content from you in in, in good faith um, it's a lot of responsibility um and if you want to do that and not be an asshole at the same time it weighs down on you, um, mm. so that's that's really uh, that's really you know there's a lot of concrete cases where you're like shit I'm 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 you know I I can sense that a lot of people on the team are not feeling well and I might lose them or shit we're running out of cash or you know the community is really in a, in a bad mood and you can sense that there's people that are rambling and uh, it's it's honestly every single day is a different challenge. That's I, the only thing I can say with certainty is. Um, the the scale and the scope of the challenges and of the problems increases over time. So the stuff that I thought was hard three years ago, I wish would come back today. Uh, the stuff that was hard the day we founded the company, uh, it's you know it's mm. peanuts today. It it just gets harder. It doesn't get easier. Um, <laughs> I. I I I laugh when I think of like oh yeah it'll get easier once I once there's thirty engineers on the team. Mm, nah. No. 